Greetings Mr. Lai, this is Brute Farm, we will be doing our criminal video assignment. The people in our team are Melissa, Mior, Risha, Chris and myself. Melissa, myself and Mior shall be doing question number one, and Risha and Chris shall be doing question number two. Without further ado, I leave it to Melissa. Is rape narrowly defined in Malaysia? Rape is dealt under section 375 of the Malaysian Penal Code. Sexual intercourse indicates that rape is limited to circumstances when there is insertion of a penis into a vagina. Therefore, insertion of any other parts of a man's body or object into any other orifices of a woman's body does not constitute as rape. These acts of sexual assault which may lead to greater physical injury implies that they are less serious. What then are the issues with the definition of rape under Section 375 Penal Code? How is it narrowly defined? My first issue here is that, from this provision, the victim must be a woman and not a man. Gender neutrality within rape st statutes is a concept that under criminal law, men and women should be recognised as rape victims and perpetrators. In India, the proposed Criminal Law Amendment Bill 2012 seeks to replace the current provisions on rape with provisions of sexual assault. So sexual assault the definition of sexual assault includes penal, penal vagina penetration, penal non-vagina penetration, and penetration with an object amongst others. The proposed amendments could cover non-consensual sex between same-sex partners or between men and transgender persons and are gender neutral in terms of both accused and survivor. In Malaysia, there is a Code of Practice on the Prevention and Eradication of Sexual Harassment in the Workplace 1999. This is gender neutral. It can be sexual harassment for a woman to a man, not confining to a woman as in usual cases. However, this is not a piece of legislation. The function of rape laws to protect people that include males that includes males from sexual violation of their sexual autonomy and Malaysia should move in the direction India and England has taken. My second point here is on marital rape. Marital rape is not recognised in Malaysia because the traditional view is that consent to marriage is equivalent to consent to sexual intercourse and as long as the marriage exists, the right to intercourse cannot be revoked. So the only exception here under the penal code is when the wife is under the age of 13 and during the ADA period. Also under, the, under section 375A of the penal code, a husband may be prosecuted or imprisoned up to 5 years by forcing his wife to have sex by threatening violence or by harming her as this is an offence in both civil and sharia legal system. However, the turning case is in R&R &R 1991 where the English court held that there is no longer a rule of law that the wife was deemed to agree to sexual intercourse upon marriage and cannot retract their consent. A husband can be convicted of rape or attempted rape of his wife where she had withdrawn the consent to sexual intercourse. In Malaysia, Suhakam has proposed amendments to the Penal Code and Criminal Procedure Code for marital rape to be recognised as a penal offence. However, this was strongly opposed mainly by Muslims. A study conducted among 133 sexual offenders in Kajang and Sungai Buloh prisons found that only 20% of sexual offenders committed their offences against strangers. It must be remembered that the exception as provided in Section 375 in relation to marital rape was introduced by the English based on common law. Reforms should be made for marital rape to be criminalised with sentences on par with those for rape under Section 375 instead of discarding the notion aside as influences from the Westerners. My third point here is on statutory rape. So if a woman under the age of 16, any sexual intercourse would immediately be deemed as rape under the law even if there was consent on her part. However, even though the legal married age of Muslim girls is 16 and 18 for Muslim men, they can marry before those ages with the permission of their parents and the Sharia courts. So um, this contradiction between the two laws, it creates a loophole waiting to be exploited by anyone looking to escape prosecution for statutory rape. An example is the case of No Fazira Saad, who married a 19 year old boyfriend at the mere age of 12. In Singapore, Section 376A Penal Code, the sexual penetration for minor under 16 protects both male and female victims. So, even though legally a boy cannot be a victim of rape, he can still be a victim of the offence under Section 376A in Singapore. However, this does not apply in Malaysia. An example being a 14-year-old boy who will be left with no redress. My fourth point here is on consent, which is covered under Section 90 Penal Code Malaysia. The English law on rape is very clear on this issue. 
At trial for a rape offence, the jury has to consider whether the man truly believed that the woman was consenting to sexual intercourse. Whether or not there are grounds for that belief is left subjectively to the jury. In many countries, the rape laws have been amended whereby the defendant has to prove that there was consent for sexual intercourse. In Malaysia, however, the position still remains unchanged and the prosecution has to establish that the woman did not consent. However, showing consent can prove both difficult and controversial for the defendant. Defendant often can prove direct evidence of consent. In certain cases, consent is impossible to prove. Examples where the victims are minor, in incapacitated or mentally challenged and incapable of understanding the sexual nature of the behaviour, and it's impossible for the victim to consent to the defendant's actions. My final point here is under section 375A against her will. So this subsection, it places the burden on the rape victim to show evidence of physical violence that could be considered as an act against her will. But we all know that the absence of injury does not necessarily mean, necessarily mean that the woman was a willing partner. This so at present, post-law reforms in many countries, the main issue pertaining to rape is the question of valid consent for intercourse. However, this is still retained in Malaysia and the rule of law that the testimony of the complainant in a sexual offence case needs to be corroborated by independent witness such as medical evidence or any other evidence. Now look at what constitutes factual and legal rape. When we look at factual rape, I'd like to define it as any act that brings about the same repercussions and impact as rape. We will look to marital rape, carnal intercourse, and sexual intercourse with minor without consent. When we look at legal rape, however, it is defined in this narrow sense where only, a, only certain sexual acts or sexual offences can be counted as rape. Having had the narrowness of rape exposed, we will look at the conviction process. The conviction process is one that's very difficult to pass altogether. When we look at the first stage is police. Any rape that happens that goes reported first goes to the police, which at that stage can be thrown out for a variety of reasons. It could be without any corroborative evidence. And we all know rape doesn't happen in broad daylight with multiple witnesses around. After that point, it goes to the attorney general's chambers. The AG's chambers do not prosecute or send to court any case on a women fancy. They actually require about 90% certainty that they will win the case. And only after that, it is brought to court. In court, the case can be thrown out for a multitude of reasons, even technicalities where the actual act of rape is not in dispute, but a breach in the chain of evidence can have the whole case thrown out altogether. Now, the process alone can be said to be difficult, but nothing presents the facts of the matter, like cold heart statistics and figures. When we look at this, Free Malaysia today estimates that about 3,000 cases of rape are reported every year. Halida Ali, the president of the Perak Women for Women Society, said that in 2013, 2,111 men were reported for raping girls under the age of 18 alone. Of this number, only 461 were charged. That means they got past the Attorney General's chambers. And in court, only 14 were successful with their conviction. Now, when we look to the conviction rates, the poor conviction rates, that alone is not enough of an aggravating factor. What further aggravates this situation is the fact that there are not enough of a severe um, punishment or penalty imposed on rape. When we look to English law, under the, under the Sexual Offences Act 2003, we see that both rape and assault by penetration are punishable by a maximum of life imprisonment under section 1 and section 2. While rape can only be, con can only be done by a man to a woman, a self penetration can happen with either. And it is in fact taken as seriously. So we see here in English law there's a life imprisonment maximum. However, in Malaysian law, we see section 375 of the Penal Code imposing a maximum sentence of only 22 years with liability for whipping. Oddly, however, in addition to rape, the same 20 years and whipping is imposed on buggery with an animal, committing carnal intercourse, and even sexual connection by object. Now, at this point I would like to draw the attention of this video to the fact that rape and assault by penetration in the UK is punishable by a maximum of life. However, in Malaysia it's only a maximum of 20 years. The situation does not end there, it goes a step further. I'd like to 
look at marital rape at this point. Marital rape or domestic rape is governed under Section 375 of the Penal Code in Malaysia and Sexual Offences Act 2003 in the English law. When we look at marital rape in Malaysia, a maximum of five years is imposed. However, this came from English law back in the day. After the cut-off period, however, R and R came about. In that sense, English law accepted marital rape and thought of it as any other rape, and because of that, life imprisonment could be imposed. However, Malaysia remains as the five years, and because of that, it, it presents quite a bit of a deterrent factor. I shall leave this at this point, marital rape, being only a maximum of five years, and my colleague, my teammate, Mior, shall take over from here to talk about the deterrent factor. There are many deterrent factors that prevent the victims from speaking out of what had transpired. Generally, criminal law is there to prevent or to deter the perpetrator from committing crimes. Rather, what we're seeing right now is the law preventing or deterring the victims from speaking out of what had transpired. For instance, in Malaysia, the punishment for rape is 20 years and the punishment for militia rape is 5 years. In contrast, in the UK, for all three uh, for all three crimes, it is life imprisonment. And there's another contrast here with Mauritia rape. Mauritia rape in Malaysia covers only five years maximum, but in the UK, uh, courtesy of R&R, it is subjected to life imprisonment. But the problem here lies with the fact that for Mauritia rape in Malaysia, Usually, the husbands serve only half of the time that they were supposed to serve. There are also many other internal barriers that prevent the victims from speaking out of what had transpired. For instance, you have the gender bias, and then you have a lack of training in dealing with rape cases uh, for the police officers, and then you have women being the property of their husband and wife, victim blaming, and others which are recovered by Wisha. Another major deterrence factor is social stigma, specifically victim blaming or victim shaming. Society have always frowned upon the idea of rape, and this goes on on both ways, both to the perpetrator and the victim. The problem here lies with the idea, the idea that even if you are the victim, there must be something that you have done on the part of the victim that have triggered the rape. Victim blaming victimized the already distraught victim by introducing ideas that the victim had introduced an, un, an unwanted attention on their person, such as probably by wearing skimpy outfits, or being drunk, or being socially unbecoming towards other male. Muslim majority society might have aggravated the situation by refusing to acknowledge that there is such a thing as Mauritius rape. It was argued that there can never be a force-induced sex between husband and wife. The argument here is because when they decided to get married, it is, among others, is to have a lawful sexual relationship in the eyes of religion. Furthermore, another major deterrence factor is when the perpetrator is known personally to the victim or their family. This is basically to avoid embarrassment. And finally, there is a social experiment conducted by Astro Ulagam titled Would You Marry a Rape Victim? where it stated that three out of four ethnic Indian that were approached refuses to marry a rape victim citing reasons such as bringing dishonor to the family and or too many questions as if the issue is ever brought up. I shall now proceed to the second part. Introduction. There are several myths about rape and the victims that put a negative impact on the society's attitudes towards rape and the survivors as well as the responsiveness of the criminal justice system. Rape is dealt under Section 375 of the Malaysian Penal Code. Even if the existing laws and heavy punishments are here, rape still remains a serious problem in this modern society. Rape cases have been drastically rising almost doubling since 2003 and the government affirms that rape cases are underreported to the police because of various reasons which will be discussed below. Are the police doing enough for the rape victims? Here are some statistics. There has been an approximate fall by 27% over two years in the number of cases investigated by D11. 
However, over four years, the number of cases reported have increased by almost 53%. But the Ministry of Women, Family and Community Development stated that only 10% of rape cases are reported. They suggested that 30,000 of rape incidents occurred in 2007. The attitudes towards rape victims scale is a very popular and commonly used scale to assess attitudes towards rape survivors. It has been used in 14 different countries, inclu including Malaysia. They found out that psychologists and NGOs show a favorable attitude towards survivors, while police officers demonstrate a least favorable attitude towards survivors. Reasons for low convictions from reported cases fail to identify suspects by victims. Police doesn't have the ability to trace the accused because of lack of intelligence gathered or physical evidence obtained. Incomplete reporting and investigation by the police because of high amount of cases handled by investigating officers. Investigating papers are not being processed. Police fail to investigate at the scene of crime. From past cases, victims are being blamed for rape. Large backlog in the court system as cases are often postponed either because witnesses disappear or are no longer willing to testify. Police officers' perception. Some police officers lack training and experience, especially in a marital union. It is considered that marital rape is impossible because the husband had the legal right to have sex with his wife. Very often, burden of proof rests on the shoulder of the survivors. If they arrive at the station late without any sign of physical violence on her or without any bruises on her body and dressing and speaking like a normal people, person, sorry, the police officer may disbelieve her and refuse to lodge the report. In one case, the police insisted that the survivor's parents to be informed before the, they write the report, even if the wo single woman are up to the age of 35. If the woman has any previous criminal record or has sexual experience with persons other than the accused, they might think that the victim is lying. Hence, this is why rape survivors prefer not to lodge a report against the accused. However, now questions concerning sexual activities of the complainant are not allowed in the court. This is a progressive step as before victims were being cross-examined about their sexual encounters with other persons than the suspect in order to discredit their moral behavior. Experience of rape survivors. Another re reason why rape cases are underreported is because of the experience that rape survivors have to go through. The rape survivors and their family go through a continuation of trauma and violence during the pursuit of justice. In some police stations, in order to identify perpetrators, the survivors need to touch them. As a result, survivors may flee, flee the city or withdraw the cases. Marital rape. According to Malaysian law, marital rape is not recognized. Marriage license is considered as license to rape. According to Amnesty International, domestic violence is regarded as a private matter. Police is unwilling to take action against those who may have assaulted the spouses and relatives within the within home. Police advises women seeking to lodge a report against husband to go back home and resolve the issues within the family. Feminist literature states that women are often made to believe that they are responsible for being raped for being a rape victim. Creation of the Royal Commission and International Best Practices. Increase the representation of ethnic min minorities and female in force. In 2003, out of 5,218 police officers, only 61 women were recruited. Police officers around the world have made a positive image through independent police watchdogs. In Singapore, the corrupt Practices Investigation Bureau, where corruption cases are being investigated throughout the island. They have also investigated in criminal offences revealed in the course of cor uh, corruption investigation. After dealing with the perception of the police, we will move on to the investigation part of the police towards rape cases. The very basis is on the legal framework of criminal procedures. Investigation of rape cases, like any other criminal investigation under any Acts of Parliament, is governed by the Criminal Procedure Code. It may be said that investigation of rape cases will not differ so much compared to any other crime. The police, in working within the law, on 16 of May 2007, established the Sexual Women and Special Investigation Department under the Criminal Investigation Department in view of the rising cases 
involving women and children. The division consists of Sexual Investigation Unit, Child Investigation Unit, Child Interview Center, Victim Care Center, and Domestic Violence Investigation Unit. D11 in a nutshell involves investigation and victim support. In terms of victim support, the police have achieved some evidence breakthrough through the establishment of Child Interview Center or CIC. Evidence of Child Witness Act 2007 was passed to facilitate the court to make use of the investigation material by method of recordings in CIC. Improved evidence has significantly increased the conviction rate. The establishment of CIC reduces the psychological impact of child victims to go through stressful environment to give evidence in criminal court. Evidence in video recorded while the memory is still fresh will improve the evidence reliability of child witness. The police has also set up the Victim Care Center or VCC to provide emotional support to victims of sexual, domestic and kidnapped cases. It also provides team therapy and counseling to underage victims. It also provides agency service for references to other departments and organizations. In dealing with legality of an evidence, it is a treated laws that evidence obtained illegally is still admissible under the Evidence Act 1950. This is, this is confirmed by the Federal Court in PP and Haji Kashim, as well as Supreme Court in Ramli, Bintachi and PP. The DNA ID Act was passed in 2009. In view of modern technology which have changed the landscape of evidence obtained in rape cases, residuals of semen, body fluids and blood stains are scientifically analysed nowadays. The High Court of Sabah and Sarawak in Rizwan bin Masood and PP has convicted defendant for rape with his DNA found on victim body which was obtained illegally. Federal Court in Datuk Amal Ibrahim and PP has also reaffirmed that as admissibility of DNA evidence obtained illegally is not affected. The police also emphasize on procedural comfort for rape victim. Should victim decide to make a report immediately after rape, police will take it as a fresh case and given highest priority to the investigation. At a police station, police women will be dispatched to accompany the victim to the hospital for checkup. The government also emphasized on interdependent collaborations through the establishment of OSCC. The victim has an alternative to approach any emergency and trauma department of any government funded hospital immediately after being raped. Reference will be automatically made to the offices in police or social welfare department for counselling and investigation to the victim. In relation to the statistics, within the figure, reported cases has been significantly dropped over the years. The increased number of CICs has not significantly increased the number of recorded investigations conducted by the police. Such trend has can be indeed said that to be a waste of resources in maintaining large number of CICs together with expensive recording equipment in an independence buildings from contingent headquarters to police stations. The government transformation programs and rate. GTP has targeted to reduce crime perception index in the state of crime itself. In 2013, police reduced violence and property crime mainly due to Operasi Opera Chantas Has that counters emergency ordinance former detainees, which involved in serious firearm related cases but not rape per se. Perceptions of police officers, cultural influence, and retypism in the support system have crippled and nullified the innovative state taken by the police in enhancing rape investigation. Lack of training by professional bodies and experts towards the police, medical officers, and welfare department has also crippled the functions of the interdepartment corporations and OSCCs. In relation to the reforms, Pasukan Gerakan Arm or PGA which have been set up during an emergency to counter guerrilla warfare should be fully decommissioned and personnel to be directed to departments with shortage including D11 to overlook sexual and domestic violence crimes. While GTP focuses on reducing the ratio of investigation, investigating paper and investigating officer by recruiting more investigation officers, the quality of investigation will not be improved tremendously with improved quantity but not quality. Section 120 of CPC should also be amended to inculcate continent civil law inquisitorial system to direct pre-trial investigation fully with assistance 
of the public prosecutor to the police.